You've been called to the CEO's office. You've been busting your hump all year. You think to yourself, I deserve this. Your boss slides a piece of paper across the table. This is the moment you've been waiting for. Because you know there's never been a better time to test drive the 2019 Mercedes-Benz GLA at your authorized Mercedes-Benz dealer. That's right, the sleek SUV you've had your eye on at a truly surprising price. Visit MBUSA.com slash GLA to learn more. Mercedes-Benz, the best or nothing. Hello and welcome to the Olympic and Bundy podcast. I'm Kelly Taylor. Derek Warburton is the creative director and co-owner of La Palme Magazine. He has his own jewelry line. He's worked as a celebrity stylist, among many other things in life, as you'll hear. He has some great takeaways about the fashion industry itself and other aspects of his life. He is a hustler. So buckle up and enjoy. From the Fox 11 studios in Los Angeles, California, it's the Olympic and Bundy podcast with host Kelly Taylor. All right, so this is a true story that not a lot of people know. I, years ago, you know, because I was living in New York, and I was like, it, it felt like I'd done my run. Like, you need to reinvent yourself. And I have always been able to reinvent. And I'm not a, I don't own something, and I'm like, I'm dead to, like, this is, this is it. I roll with the punches. So, you know, and this, like, everything changed in 2008, especially in fashion, because of the crash. And so retail changed forever. The web was coming up and just everything changed. And I saw being a stylist not being as prosperous anymore. And I'm like, uh, you're done. Like either move over. So that's how the television really started because we started probably, what, we started in what, 2007, right? Because we've been friends 11 years now. Yeah, so it's 2007 we started. And I just saw the change of, and then I got some private clients too for personal shopping. So that took me around the world and that was a major cash. And I was like, I'm not going to go on set. The rates were dropping by the day. Yeah. Because every child, you know, it's the internet now. Every kid thinks they're a stylist. Everybody thinks they're a makeup artist. Everyone thinks they're a photographer because they got an iPhone. It's a joke. Yeah. So, you know, and we've all worked for 20 something years in this industry and we're like, sit down, dear. <laughs> but, yeah. but, you know, everyone has to start somewhere. So I'm not a hater. I'm like, all right, I'm a motivator. Yeah. Keep it moving. What am I going to do? I'm not a hater. I'm a motivator. I yeah. Like that. No, because it's like, uh huh. Because, you know, I've changed myself so much that if people were hating on me, I just don't, I, I, I treat people how I want to get treated and I just keep it moving and f you if you don't get it, fine, done. Yeah. So um, I had got approached by, um, have you ever heard of Tony and Tina's Wedding? It was a huge no. off-Broadway show in the 80s in New York and it was literally two different places. So it started in a church and everybody in the audience was involved. And then you went to a restaurant and it was literally Tony and Tina's wedding. It was like you went to a wedding. It was hilarious. Okay. But there's actors and everything. So they moved it to Broadway and they asked me to do a limited run. Singing, dancing, the whole thing. I know. And I hadn't sung since high school where I was really trained and doing a lot. But then it was like, oh, my God, how am I going to pull this off? And then the show canceled before I even start. I literally. And I had a breakdown and I moved to Key West and lived in a hotel for a month and then looked like Tan Mom by the time I got back to normal. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about oh, Tan no, Mom. For real. For real. Yeah, it was um, scary. Can we circle back to the off-Broadway thing? Yeah. Were you friends with these people? Were you already doing that? No. I met them. It was a publicist. My entire life is publicist. Uh -huh. Thank God for publicists, or yeah. I'd be still sitting in New Hampshire, like, you know, peeling potatoes, yeah. working at the Mac counter or whatever. Uh, they don't even have a Mac. That tells you. Chanel. I'd no work Mac. at Chanel at least. Or a clinic. Yeah. Clinic. <laughs> clinic. I know. A pure alcohol. You'll look great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, no, I... Uh, I had met them and I was hosting a party or something. I did, you know, I've always hosted a lot of parties because it just keeps you out there and it keeps you relevant, you know? Sure. Um, so I hosted this party and she was like, I have this fabulous idea. And the one thing I've pride myself on in LA and in New York, I can fill a room. Because you and know a lot all of people. people. Yes, I know everyone, you know? Gotcha. The maid to the president. Yeah, I yeah, know yeah, everybody, yeah. you know? Yeah. And I've always been like that because I'm, ch you know, chatty Cathy, whatever. So you've always been chatty Cathy? Oh, yes. Even yes. like as a little kid? No, no. As a kid, I, uh, I had this really abusive childhood. It was terrible. But 
I learned so much from it. And when I could finally be myself, there was no stopping me. <laughs> and that was it. And I just went from there. No, I couldn't even look you in the eye at 14 years old. Yeah. Wait, and then can I, we talk and then about, I grew out of that. Can we talk a little bit about New Hampshire? Did you grow yeah. up entirely in New Hampshire? No, I lived. So basically, quick synopsis, because there's an hour and we don't, this isn't a 10 hour gig. Um, <laughs> I grew up in New Hampshire. My parents got divorced. My mother all of a sudden met this woman. We were all kind of shocked. And then her partner was really abusive. We ended up moving to upstate New York. It was terrible. We ended up in Florida. We were homeless. No, no nothing. No electric, no water, no sanitation. That's why I'm a goodwill ambassador for yeah. clean water now. Um, and it was literally living in the woods. But I went to school every day and was a straight-A student. Wow. Yeah. So wait. Yeah. You said so your your mom was married to your father. They got divorced. Yes. And then, then you found out. How old were you when they got divorced? Ten. And then how soon did she start dating? Ten and a half. Wow. It was boom, boom. And not a clue. And what's so funny is that, I, which I've never discussed ever, exclusive. <laughs> Fox 11. Hey, hey. Hey. Um, my mother cheated on him with another man. And then all of a sudden she was with a woman. It was crazy. Wow, did and she... this is like as a child seeing all that. It was it was just a little nuts. Did and you... my brother had just died too. So I think it was so much emotional trauma for her. You're... I don't even think you know any of this. Yeah. Yeah, my brother died of SIDS, sudden infant death yeah. syndrome. And it was just it just knocked everyone. And her mother, who was paraplegic, died all within a year. So to lose a child and your mother all at the same time, I just think she lost it. Yeah, you know, and then totally. ended up in this relationship for a long time, but couldn't come out. So it was just so many layered things, which which I understand where a lot of mental abuse would come from and a lot of abusive things. And then I think by the time we were homeless, which there was no need for because I could have lived with my dad and I mm -hmm. had a new stepmom and a new brother. Did everything. they stay in New Hampshire? They all did and oh. didn't know anything. I lied. I had oh. to lie. I had to lie about every, I mean, every single thing. That's Did really, you take a cookie? No. Like, I lied yeah. about everything because it was a safety mechanism. And I think that's why I'm such an honest, like, brutally honest to, to a fault person now because I went through all these things since childhood, and I really, I learned how to process them. And then once you learn how to process, you can move forward mm -hmm. and live in truth. And I think that's really important for a lot of people, like, you know, a lot of kids that are really suffering. It's like, you know what, once you can process why people treat you the way they do, why you're in a situation you're in, and then you can see over the hump and be able to move forward with it, you can, you can be successful. You can love yourself. And it's really important. You know, I tell myself, I mean, him this morning, we were laughing. I was like, did anyone tell you that they love you today? I love you. You're my friend. Mm -hmm. I love you. You know, and pe I think people need to hear that every day, but people need to say it to themselves every day. And that's the first thing I say in the morning, honey. I love you. I me. love you, Derek. I love you, dear. Your name is um, Kelly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but do you see what I yeah. mean? Like, it's really important that you, you have to step outside of yourself because, you know, so many of us, t t you know, I talk to you, you talk to me. But a lot of us can't process the fact that we can talk to ourselves. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? 100%. And so every morning I wake up, and if I don't say it, it knocks my day out. I'm like, you are blessed. Mm -hmm. You are prosperous. You are grateful. You are kind. Mm -hmm. I love you. Every day. Yeah. That's the first thing I say. And I repeat it because sometimes I need to repeat it because I forget how kind I am and I don't act kind. And, you know, but it's really important to me that no, but that keeps me because that's something I need to work on. But I'm still processing. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? Definitely. And when you're a young kid growing up, the situation that you grow up in, that's all, you know. Yes. So you're like, OK, this is how the world is. Mm -hmm. This is how adults act. This is just how this is the this is what we're dealing with. Yeah. And then as you get older and meet other people, see how other relationships are, how other people live, then you start to be like, wait a second. Yeah. That's not right. What, exactly. What's going on in my life? Why, why, why did that happen to me? And then it's almost like probably a period of resenting certain things. And then eventually when you start to, I'm just, I'm just sort of guessing here. And then when you start to 
get older and maybe think a little bit deeper about the situation itself, maybe you can take a step back and sort of look at it like, okay. What it did to me, um, so by the time I left her, and I haven't seen her since the day I left. Your I mom? was 15 years old because I was going to commit suicide. That's why I still talk a lot about being suicidal because I just, I knew it was going to go one way or the other. Mm-hmm. And I was either going to heal or I was going to go. And I was already there by 13. Like, this is not going to work. This is not going to work. And it just continued. There were so many crazy things that happened in my life. Just like my, because we lived with my my mother's partner's parents. Oh, wow. And he ended up in the mental hospital and in jail for holding a place hostage with the shotgun. Six o'clock news. I'm 13 years old. All these crazy things. Mm-hmm. And I had come from a very good, very lower middle class, but middle class family. Uh, never wanted for anything. I was a, such a happy kid. And then, boom, all mm. of this comes at you. And then, you know, it's so funny. Everyone always asks, oh, did you have a hard time coming out? And I was like, uh, the opposite. Because I had already went through it mm. with my mother. And I, and, and but living in denial. I'm like, we're all living in the same house. Like, you are partners. It, there's no question about it. And it was so, such denial through oh. everything. It was crazy. Meaning like it they weren't gay. They weren't, they weren't talking gay. about it oh, out no. loud. Oh, that, the opposite. Wow. The opposite. It was such a joke. And it was like right in front of us. And uh, they were in love. And I mean, I honor that. You yeah, know, I would never yeah. criticize that. Mm-hmm. And it's just funny because, you know, everyone's like, oh, do you have a coming out story? You know, that's such a, when you're a gay guy, it's like, oh, what's your coming out story? Yeah. And I was like, my mother, my mother was gay. I handled it. And the only reason why I didn't say anything is because it was a different time and I was more afraid because I had already ran from a situation. So when I moved in with my dad and my stepmom, I was just afraid because I didn't want to get kicked out Yeah. because I was watching it going on around me. So, Every gay kid I knew was being kicked out of their house. They were homeless. And I was like, I was already homeless. Yeah. <laughs> Shut up. Yeah. You know, but at the same time, I was healing myself. So you're 15, left Florida, went back up to New Hampshire? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I haven't seen her wow. since. And I haven't seen her partner. And I'm getting on the plane. And I, 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 it's such a movie. I'm literally climbing the stairs. It was like one of those, like climbing the stairs to the staircase. And she yells after me, are you going to say goodbye to Bonnie, which is her partner? And I go, no. And <laughs> walked up the stairs. And that was it. That was Never, it. ever spoke to her again or have seen her since. And my mother, I've spoken to, and she just, the poor thing, you know, tried to keep manipulating me even after I left, which worked for a little while. So the conversation kept going. And then by high school graduation, she wouldn't come to my high school graduation because she was uncomfortable that my father would judge her. Mm. And I was like, understood. Okay. And then that was that. But at 25, this is crazy. I spoke to her again because she was claiming she had Huntington's disease, which you know is a neuro disorder that mm-hmm. my uncle had, and she claimed she had it, and that I had it, and I needed to get tested. So that's how she got. And my poor father, you know, I don't give him a lot of credit. He's like a really rough tumble kind of guy, um, and no, but again, no one knew. I didn't tell anyone for years. No one knew, even because my stepmom and my dad, I moved in, and they didn't know what was wrong with me. They're like, what is wrong with this kid? Because I was, I, mean, I was seriously, I had emotional issues, right. big ones, big ones. And when I moved in, because no one could even understand, like, what happened or what, why I was the way I was. And because the they, lying. And, and they the weren't aware of, of No, they knew nothing. I told no one anything. No way. I was terrified. Mm. I was terrified. And then finally, my stepmom and I, who is my mom now, like she, we are so tight. She, we had a breakthrough. And then it just came out and I just was a puddle. And she was too. You know, I mean, it's a lot. Yeah. It's a lot to go through. And it's a lot to hold in. You know, so that's why, you know, a lot of the charity work I do and everything, it's like, it's so deep rooted and I keep it real light on the surface because I can't, yeah. I can't go there yeah. because I've closed that door. And, you know, once you close an emotional door like that, you really, it's mm-hmm. close the damn door mm-hmm. <laughs> because it will 
make you wallow for life and cause so many more dramas and so many more issues. And so, you know, but that's, I, I wouldn't be who I am now at all without it. Never. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't have the drive. I wouldn't be willing. I, I literally just gave up my apartment for six months. I have no apartment right now. I'm like kind of bouncing because I wanted to go and build my career. And I've been in Europe and doing everything to keep building, keep building. Yeah. It has been my driving force of my life, everything that I went through. That's always really interesting to me to hear what you're talking about right now. If, if you grew up with um, a rough situation, it seems like you can go one of two ways. Yes. Like you can kind of continue down that path yes. to sort of what you know, or you can like totally be reverse and sort of be super ambitious to sort of like reach for success. Yes. Right? Yes. And you're obviously the latter. Yes, for sure. <laughs> um, yeah. And... Th- Thank the universe you had your stepmom, like someone to talk oh to. Oh my gosh. I mean, my grandmother, my father's mother, and her saved my life. Mm. They really did. And they were just kind. It's again, kind. Yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. Which is why I constantly have to remind myself to be kind. Because I could yeah. turn. It's easy, but it, it's work. Everything's work in our lives. You know that. I mean, we nothing comes easy and nothing comes free. Definitely. It's work, it's work, it's work, it's work. And so I just constantly have to work on it. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the Uber over here, the lady, oh, I was like, oh, this lady is going to get it. And then it was like, <laughs> be kind, be kind. She doesn't know the difference. Yeah. You know what I mean? You know, it's yeah. like when you live a past fight. And I was like, okay, honey, we're yeah. late. Girl, step on it, dear. Let's go. Mm-hmm. You know, and we're listening to La Cucaracha in the car, and she is going just as slow. La I was like, girl, let's La go. Cucaracha. You're killing me right now. I know. You know, yeah, but it's like, be kind, be kind, be kind. Yeah. When I get frustrated with strangers, I think of them as like, oh, what if this was my mom or my parent or my sister or my child? Or... We don't know what type of day. <sighs> yeah. We don't know their situation. We don't know what they're going through at the moment. And maybe they just need to take it a little slow. Mm. Maybe they need to be whatever they are. And, you know, we all it's, it's human emotion. We all go through it. And, you know, we have to we can't forget that we all go through different things and we never know, you know. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. Well, this so, went into a different turn that I, I didn't expect this morning. <laughs> I thought we were going to talk about diamonds and clothes. <laughs> I know nothing my about either. My favorite things. But... <laughs> my favorite things. Wait, so so you get through high school. Yes. When when do you suddenly get into cuz I know you worked as a makeup artist? I did. First. Yes. What what how, what was your what were your interests? Like young Derek, teenage Derek, when you when like what what were your hobbies? What was like things that you generally were into? I, as an escape, had magazines. Okay. Magazines. Oh. I had magazines. It was Vogue and Bizarre and yeah. L and all these magazines. And I dreamed of being in them, seeing myself there, uh, owning mm-hmm. a magazine, doing magazine work. I've literally done magazine work for years, and now I own a magazine, and I'm about to launch a new one. And, you know, it it has definitely taken me time, and but it's worth it. Mm-hmm. Everything that takes time is worth it. You know? Yeah. It's, it, I, I, and that's another thing I'm constantly saying. It takes time. It takes time. It takes time. And I didn't hit young. I'll hit older, because I haven't hit yet. I love that. And I know I won't hit for another 10 plus years, I think. You know, it's it's and coming say, and it's growing. When you say hit, you mean like really hit your stride in your career? Yes. Or? Yes. Whether, because I knew my entire life because of how I grew up that I'd be fabulously wealthy. Girl, I don't know how that's going to happen, but I'm working on it. I'll work on it and work on it. Same, Derek. Yeah, no, you know, but I've always known things about myself because there's one thing I am is intuitive. And I know when I need to make a change. I know when I need to grow. I know this isn't going to work. I know it. Boom. Make a change. Mm -hmm. That's why, you know, I've, I still have friends from 20 something years ago. I'm really loyal, but you know. I needed a baseline and then because that allows you once you have your base things can move and things can you know you don't have to be so concrete about things because you always need your foundation but once you have a foundation you can grow yeah you know yeah and that's really important 
Um, I want to kind of wind a little bit through your career because yeah. you honestly have done, like, I feel like you are like scrappy, like in a good <laughs> way. <laughs> in more ways than one. Yes. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yes. I am scrappy. No one fucks with me. No, I like yeah, that. Yeah. 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 Cause if you will, if you do, I will come for you. Well, in the industry that you work myself. in, I, I feel like in, in fashion, the fashion industry in general, and like the beauty and fat, that whole area over there yeah. is very intimidating to me. So if someone that. was and, and, like, and it should be. Yeah. If someone was like, okay, you're going to, if someone was like held a gun to my head and they were like, you need to be a fashion stylist, I wouldn't make it. Like, I, I don't right. don't even know the first place to start. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because so, it's, it's tough, trust me. So you're working as a makeup artist, and then I was reading about how you moved to Miami to start yes. Atomic. No. So no. basically, I worked as a makeup artist. Originally, I worked for a model agency. Oh, okay. And I was starting to do makeup there. And makeup was a necessity because having being a stylist is the most thankless, horrible career ever. <sighs> You imagine. have to love it. You have to have such passion or you'll never make it. Mm -hmm. Because it is such a passionate thing. You're not there for the money. Especially now because there is none. And everyone wants it's yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know. Everyone wants to do it. Yeah. Exactly. And also everyone wants it free. You know. Because everyone uh, thinks they're a genius. So that's why. Which I get. Right. But um, I started doing makeup out of necessity because I couldn't afford to be a stylist. And then that brought me a lot though. You know, I mean, it took me to Miami and I had a very good job and I could have, and I mean, I was six, making six figures at 22 years old. I was doing really well. Oh, you went to Miami at 22. I was 23, I wow. think. I was in New York. I went to FIT. I did tons of internships. The Fashion Institute thing. of Technology, right? Yes, okay. yes. Or fags and training, depending on how you think. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, no, that's that's what <laughs> everyone called it when I went there. No, whatever. And, and most of the school, it's it's all, it's all so much graphic design that uh -huh. no one's gay. It's hilarious. Oh. Yeah, yeah. It's just the design kids, and we're all yeah, wild. Yeah. And, you know, that was Richie Rich days and the club kids. And I went out every night and did that. Yeah. But I went to work every day full time. And I had three internships. I just keep it busy. Right. Just keep it busy. So you're you're into these magazines as an escape as a kid, but you yes. get into fashion. Like yes. that's like sort of has it was been there was no other choice. I didn't know what else. I, I, funny enough, the only other thing that I would have done, which this is nobody knows this about me, I taught middle school math to kids with Down syndrome, oh. uh, all through high school because they were the only ones that were kind to me. And that's why, because I was so horribly bullied and teased. And so that was an escape, too. And so you're so good at math. It was either, <laughs> honey, I know how to get 20% <laughs> off. That's, <laughs> that's how good at math I am and how to get the check written to me. Well, that's me. all you yeah, need that's, to know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I can get a discount in a second. Um, so that was something that I was into. And I think that also, that was very healing for me. Yeah. And I was the Special Olympics coach and did all those things and can't do one sport, but I was there supporting. I was there with love. Um, but then, you know, I – it was always known I'd go into magazines. Mm -hmm. It was always – because I spent my money at my grocery – like, I had a little grocery store job, and I spent all my money on magazines. Really? Oh, yes. Oh, there were piles and piles and piles in our basement because I just poured over things. But that was also my research, which has helped me – because I have so much reference where these kids have no reference anymore. They think Beyonce invented it. And I was like, oh, dear. She, she doesn't even know what that is. Somebody on the team stole that from some, from, from the 60s. Like, it's, it's a random Liza thing. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, but that's the world we live in now, you know, which makes me laugh. But I had just done so much research. And then I wanted to be an artist. And I was like, I could make a lot of money or I could be an artist and grow into the money. And I chose the art. That was really important to me. And so I, where I went to Miami and I still have some of those, but that, that felt like my real college years yeah. when I was in Miami because I still have the same best friends now for 20 something years. And everyone started there, everyone. And what specifically were you doing when you went to Miami work-wise? Makeup. 
Makeup. Makeup. Okay. I got my first TV gig on Road Rules. Oh. And they threw me on the show because I just cracked jokes all day and I was doing makeup and we just had a blast. Mm-hmm. And then I hosted a show called Big Boutique, uh, which was on the old Style Network. And so I would get a lot of one-offs. That's been yeah. my life. I get a one-off. You know, I have the Joan Rivers career yeah. of fashion. It's like, I'm out there, everyone knows me, but never the big hit. Never the big hit. But every, but I do everything, you know? Mm-hmm. And then I hosted another show called Fashion Avenue with an old supermodel named Jody Kidd. Her sister's a huge Gemma, Gemma Kidd. Do you know her, the makeup artist? And she has a makeup line, too. I think she may have been on our show Oh, before. probably. Yeah, she's amazing. Such a talent. She's so cool. And her sister is divine. But she was like heroin chic, one of those girls. She weighed 100 pounds. She's six foot one. One uh, of those. The yeah, kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she, um, so I did a little show with her, and that just started the hustle. Okay. You know, and no one knew me. And then, um, but I started getting editor jobs. So I have it. So I had Atomic. I met this amazing woman in Miami. And Atomic was a styling agency. It was. And they, before I got there, which I ended up owning it with with the woman that started. Her name is Teddy Gunter, another talent. And she had The Rock and their entire family. Oh. And t- helped transition him into Dwayne Johnson. Dwayne The Rock Johnson? Yeah. Yeah, they're from, they're from Miami. Oh, I didn't yeah, know that. Yeah, he went to Miami University or whatever. And the wife... Is the genius? She's amazing. Her name is Danny Garcia. She, they, they're, they're. She's the one producing all the movies now, and they're not even married anymore. He has a new girl, a baby, the whole thing. Oh, really? And they're all business partners because she is a gene. Yes, I admire her so much. She did his homework to get him out of Miami University to make sure he whatever got him into the wrestling. Th- was with him th- all through that, and she was an investment banker. He never had to work a day in his life before. Scorpion King, before wow. Scorpion King. So they are rich. What a gal. Rich, quiet. They're very quiet about it. So I know nothing about this. So you're saying that basically The Rock and his family went to Atomic and they were like, listen, we don't know how to dress. Help us. Well, you know that, do you know the, the turtleneck with the necklace yeah. and the whatever? Yeah. That's, what, that's how he came. Uh, this was before me, though. Okay. And then I worked with them a lot. Uh, just more at the time I was more officey because I needed to know how to run a business yeah. and I didn't know. And so uh, I worked with them and then the styling literally came because we also had a rental. So, you know, in Miami at the time, everyone was down there. It was just after Versace. So it hadn't died yet, if okay. you know what I mean, mm-hmm. because it was so hot. And then when he was murdered, tragically, it dwindled from there because mm. people were afraid. You know? Yeah. And then, of course, September 11th happened. That's how I ended up there. Because I went, I I got off the plane on September 7th, and I was like, "Uh uh-oh, I'm not going anywhere. That's how I ended up in Miami, really, in the end. Hmm. And uh, I met this woman, Teddy. She had The Rock going on. And then I, uh, we had a rental, and then I ended up styling everyone's rental. So they'd come in for jobs, styling jobs, and I could, because we made more money that way, and I did the entire job for them, so they gave us our, their budgets. But what ended up happening is that the stylists would come, they wouldn't even need to do it anymore. I did their entire job for them. So you're essentially like learning how to be a stylist. You're essentially like exactly. getting those skills on the job. That's exactly what happened. And then one day a girl came and she's like, you've done every job for me. 